to be here. Uh, now, uh, your, your pastor uh, will often, uh, knowing him as an expository uh, preacher that he is, uh, uh, would uh, take a verse or two or, or at the most a paragraph. How do I advance that? Uh, one more. Okay, good. Uh, all right, good. Yeah, that's happened the first uh, session too. Uh, are you going to advance it or me, bro? Uh, okay, good. <laughs> all right, good, good. All right. I'm going to hit this and go backwards, okay? You're playing tricks on me back there. <laughs> We're going to give... Ah, uh, good, good, good. Sorry about that. Uh, anyway. <laughs> anyway. Um, but I'm going to do something a little bit different this morning. I'm going to preach on two chapters. And I know that's a bit uh, ambitious. But uh, I need to do that. Um, uh, because we're not only going to look at the call of Moses, which is a familiar text to many, but we're also going to look at Moses' response to that call. And that's what I'm going to major on today. Because in doing that, I think we see a lot of, of, of ourselves uh, in this regard to how we respond to the Lord's call and the Lord's leading and what the Lord wants us to do. Uh, and uh, yes, he asks questions, and yes, he gives some excuses. And uh, I find myself, I don't know about you, but I find myself right in the middle of those questions and excuses when I know the Lord wants me uh, to do something. Um, God uses fallible people, God uses failures. God uses people that have blown it. You start going through the Bible and, and, and looking at people that God used. Oftentimes, they're people that initially failed. And I can take some encouragement uh, from that. Um, let's put it this way. I like to use this little paradigm that you can have a dream of course, we're familiar with the great speech, I have a dream. Many of us could say, I had a dream. Oh, I'm even thinking now of, it just came to mind, forgive me, uh, a song in a musical. <laughs> I had a dream. And that dream turned to a nightmare in, a, uh, in that musical. Did your dream turn to a nightmare? Uh, uh, but then I see in the Bible that there are people that had a dream, a vision, an idea, a plan, and it didn't turn out. The dream was not fulfilled. But I also see in the Bible a number of people who had a dream, experienced the death of that dream, and then experienced the rebirth of that dream, although it is often in a different form. On the screen before you is Abraham. On the screen before you is Joseph. On the screen before you is Moses. We're leading up to Moses. But think of these people. Abraham, I'm going to make you a great nation. Your name is going to be a great. Okay, 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 okay. And you're going to be a father of many peoples. You're going to be a, a father of many descendants. And in you will all your descendants be blessed. Okay, I like that. Particularly at my age, I like that. But one year clicks on to another year. Another year clicks on to another year. And Abraham looks over at uh, Sarah and she doesn't look much younger than him. And uh, okay, all right, all right. We uh, travel the whole Euphrates Valley. We've come down into Israel uh, the land of Canaan, as it was called at the time. And, and uh, where are all these kids? Where are all these kids that you promised me, God? And, I, I mean, I would settle for one. Uh, uh, you said there's going to be many d uh, descendants. Not so. So the, the dream 
apparently died. And if you want to see how it died, I, I mean, look at Genesis 15. And, 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 and Abram says, okay, thank you for helping me with that battle in, 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 in chapter 14. You're my shield and exceeding great reward. Thank you, God. But, uh, but um, what, what, what about this promise? Right now, uh, the heir of my house is a guy I picked up in Damascus, the my major domo, the head of my house, Eliezer, and he's going to be my heir, but you said he would be my seed. Uh, what's going on here? So, so the dream looks like it's dying for Abraham. And uh, then he pushes ahead and tries to do it on his own and uh, with, with his uh, maid or his wife's maid following a custom of the time and she has a child, but God says, no, he's not the one. He's not the one. Well, something's going to have to give here, God, because we're getting up there in years, and, um, and something happened. And uh, Sarah got pregnant, and when she was told she was going to get pregnant, she laughed about it. <laughs> My age? Yeah, your age. And they have a child. Their own child, not the proxy child um, that Hagar had, but, but her own child. And, and she laughed at that, and so guess what they named him? Yitzhak, laughter. <laughs> um, I didn't know it was going to work out that way, God. I had a dream. The dream died, but the dream was reborn in a different way. How about Joseph? Joseph has a dream, and, and, and almost the dream goes to his head. He's got this nice, nice duds that show that he's the number one, even though he's not the number one in, in order. He's, in, he's the numero uno kid. And uh, he lets his brothers know about it. Yeah, going along, he finally finds them there, wearing his coat. He's wandering around there first, and the guy says, what are you looking for? Uh, he's looking for my brothers. He says, why didn't you ask for directions? He says, I'm a guy. I don't ask for directions. Yeah, you know, you know. So, well, they're over there. And so he says, here I am, brothers. See my coat? That means I'm the father's finest. Oh, boy. He had a dream to be the, uh, the head, but the dream was dying. And, man, it really died when the brothers got there, as we say, comeuppance. They throw him in the pit. Take that, here's what we're going to do with that, uh, that uh, coat. They dip it in blood and send it to a grieving father. Said so this is what happened. Animal killed him. And uh, young Joseph, cocky, but now having the wind knocked out of him, is, is walks all the way down to Egypt. Let me tell you, I've been to Israel 50 times, but I've never walked from Israel to Egypt. Oh! As a slave. He's sold. And he starts to get his life turned around. And because uh, he does the right thing. And guess what? He's thrown in jail for it. For doing the right thing. Potiphar's wife comes on to him and says, Oh no, God forbid, I'm not going to do this. And What's his reward? He gets thrown in jail. For doing the right thing. Now, about that time, you would probably say... Uh, Man, this dream is dying. <laughs> but he does the right thing, and he keeps trusting, and God rebirths that dream. And before you know it, of course it happens in the Bible quickly, but it's from years, and, and he's the second in command in Egypt, and guess who needs him now? His brothers, and they come down, and they don't even know it's him. He's dressed like an Egyptian maybe speaking uh, the Egyptian language, and they don't even know it's him, and he becomes their benefactor. I used to think that he, for a while, was like dangling them over the fire and <laughs> burning their feet, you know, because he doesn't tell them who he is, and then he keeps Benjamin, and he makes them go back and try to get their father. Why don't you tell them who you are? And I think he's really not getting back at them. He's saying, are they going to do to Benjamin what they did to me? 
No, they were concerned about Benjamin. And when he saw that, that his brothers had changed, in the middle of this dramatic scene in the Bible, one of the most dramatic scenes in the Bible, Genesis 45, uh, Joseph says to all the Egyptians, leave. And he turns around. The atmosphere is thick. You can cut it with a knife. The drama. Similar to a scene in Star Wars. When a guy says to the fella he's about to kill, he thinks, Luke, I'm your father. And some of us, like Luke, says, Well, that's crazy. He's not his father. I remember the first time I saw that. Sitting in the theater with my son, there was actually one person that shouted out, don't believe him. <laughs> I'll never forget that. I'm your father. No, no, you're not my father. I'm your brother. Ooh, wasn't expecting that. Oh, it's our brother. He's alive. Uh-oh, he's alive. He says, don't be afraid. You meant it for evil, God meant it for good. Whew. Drama. Birth of a dream, death of a dream with Joseph, rebirth of a dream in a different form. Now you got Moses. Life begins at 80, folks. There's hope. <laughs> There's hope for you turning it around. Life begins at 80. Here's an 80-year-old man who had a dream. I'm going to be the deliverer of my brothers in Egypt, and I'm going to do it myself. Hey, don't mess with my boys there. <clears throat> Kills that Egyptian. Buries him in the sand. I'm a deliverer of my... No, that's not the way to do it. As a matter of fact, he didn't even win over his brothers because the next day they said, what are you going to do, kill us too? And then he realizes his dream has died. And he takes off for the wilderness 40 years becoming a somebody. That's me in Egypt. Then 40 years becoming a nobody. And that's when we meet him here. He's 80 years old. 40 years old becoming a somebody. Uh, Stephen says he was educated in all the wisdom and literature of the Egyptians. And then for 40 years, listening to this. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, what's going to happen tomorrow? <laughs> That's a come down. 40 years. Man, the dream died. Now at 80, the burning bush. The Lord speaks out of the burning bush. Moses, Moses. Whenever it's double like that, whenever it's double like that, pay attention. Abraham, Abraham. Moses, Moses. It's, it's like I'm getting your attention. Yeah. We want you to go down and deliver your people. It's now. 80? Yeah. 80. Your dream died. Now your dream is going to be rebirth, but it's going to be in a different form, Moses. Man, you'd think he'd say, yeah, let's go. <laughs> but remember, 40 years becoming a somebody, it's going to take that. Because the next 40 years of his life, life begins at 80, he shows what God can do with a somebody who thinks he's a somebody. And who becomes a nobody. Who's humbled. Now he's ready. For his dream to be reborn in a different way. He thought he was a deliverer. Now he's going to be the true deliverer of his people. Wow. Uh, now, I wish we could end there. And Moses says, let me go. I'm ready. Ready. I've been waiting 40 years for this. Let me go. Eh. He's going to need some convincing. He's going to need some convincing. That's what I want to focus in on here today. 
And I want to do it by uh, looking at uh, the two questions and the two excuses that uh, Moses uses uh, uh, to respond to this call. I have seen my people suffering in Israel, and I want you to be the one who goes down and tells Pharaoh, let my people go. A second chance. <laughs> Tell me that God doesn't give you a second chance. Wasn't thinking of this first service, so I'll throw this in. No extra charge. My dad was an alcoholic and my uncle was an alcoholic. My dad died at the age of 41, drinking re regularly for 25 years and smoking two packs of camels a day, unfiltered. He died with a massive heart attack at 41. His drinking buddy, my uncle, not his brother, but my mother's brother, was just about as bad. Broke his family's heart. But my uncle found his way to an alcoholic rehabilitation ministry, a Christian alcoholic rehabilitation ministry. He was born again. He was saved and lived a final 25, 30 years of his life as a godly father and grandfather. He got a second chance. You can get a second chance. You've blown it. Your dream died. God gave Moses a second chance, but he had to drag him almost kicking and screaming into it. Let's look at that. Two questions and two excuses. Let's pick it up at Exodus 3.10. Exodus 3.10. Come, I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. But, oh, but, <laughs> the conjunction of unbelief. <laughs> but, Moses said to God, who am I? that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children of Israel out of Egypt. First uh, question is, who am I? Now, this was not a voyage to self-discovery, folks. It's too easy to over-psychologize this and say, I need a fresh understanding of who I am. Mm. I wouldn't over-psychologize it. I would just take it for really what it's worth. And what it's worth is that a shepherd who had been listening to him <clears throat> for 40 years didn't feel like he was fully qualified. You know, all that learning of the Egyptians in the first 40 years, he'd probably forgotten. And taking care of sheep for 40 years. Who am I? I'm just a shepherd. God specializes in uh, failures, and sometimes he specializes in nobodies, particularly people who think they're hot shots and they've got the wind knocked out of them, and they've gotten humbled. That's the kind of people God uses. But first of all, he's got to say, well, who am I? I'm just a shepherd. Who am I? So, not a voyage to self-discovery, not a new self-image that he needs, because God did not say, you are. Now, if I ask you a question, and you know my name, and I say, who am I? You are going to say, you are William Varner. And I say, who? Uh, and if you ask me, who am I? And I'll say, I don't know your name. Uh, you know, but if I know your name, I'm going to say, you are, all right? That's a normal way to answer a question like this. But God doesn't answer a question. You are Moses. How does he answer it? Look at this. Verse 12, here's my answer. I will be with you. Now, what? what's that got to do with who am I? <laughs> it's got a lot to be with it. God does not engage in a uh, massage of, of, of Moses' ego and say, don't feel so bad about yourself, bro. 
you know, you, you, you're a good guy. You can do this. Don't feel so bad about yourself. No, God doesn't say that. God says, I'll be with you. The most important thing is not your voyage to self-discovery. The most important thing to know when God calls you is that if he calls you, he'll be with you in that calling that he's given you to do. I will be with you. So Moses is truly meek, but he has to become meek. Having the wind knocked out of him, the pride knocked out of him, to get himself to say, who am I? I, I'm not worthy to do this. But his answer is, I'll be with you. I know what I'm doing, Moses. If I call you to do something, you think I'm not going to go with you to do it? In a, 19, in, a, excuse me, in a 1776 letter to a fellow revolutionary... John Adams, later to be the second president of the United States, wrote this, quote, The management of so complicated and mighty a machine as the United Colonies, interesting expression, the United Colonies, requires what? The meekness of Moses, the patience of Job, the wisdom of Solomon, and the courage of Daniel. Now, I have no idea. Please don't correct me. If John Adams was born again or not, that isn't my issue here. But they knew their Bible. Notice a requirement to lead the United Colonies was meekness. Is that on your job description that you got? First thing you must do uh, to, uh, be to do this job is that you must be meek. I realize the word meek sometimes in English means weak. It, it doesn't mean that. It means humble. It means self-effacing. That's number one requirement on job description. That you must recognize your limitations. Because when you recognize your limitations, you can grow. When you recognize your limitations, what? Then you're going to be depending on the one who calls you to give you strength. And so this is actually a requirement. <laughs> Along with what? The patience of Job, the wisdom of Solomon, and the courage of Daniel. I like that. So here's what you need to know, Mo. I'll be with you. Okay, uh, I got one more question. Oh, boy, here we go. Another one. By the way, what's your name? <laughs> if the first question is, who am I? The second question, you might say, who are you? Now, it's not that God didn't know him. The word name uh, in the Bible means more than your moniker, your title. Philip de Courcy, what an elegant name. I think he's a Huguenot, a descendant of the Huguenots, isn't he? Lovely name. But Philip's name is his character. It's not just de Courcy. It's who he is. It's his character. A good name is better to be chosen than great riches. So even the Bible gives this idea of name being more than just a title that you have. It's your character, your reputation. What is your name? What is your character? What are you like so that when I buy on to this, I'll know the attributes and the characteristics of the God who's calling me? What is your name? All right, here's his name. <clears throat> uh, verse 13, Moses said to God, if I come to the people of Israel and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, they ask me, what is his name? Uh, what shall I say to them? I got to tell them your name. Now watch this answer. I love God. The way God answers questions amazes me. Verse 14, God said to Moses, I am who I am. If I heard that, I would say, well, thanks a lot. I have no idea what you're talking about. But what he's saying is huge with meaning. It's not double talk, I am who I am. 
He's saying something profoundly great here. What is his name? I am who I am. He said, say this to the people of Israel. I am has sent me to you. Now, if this still sounds a little like double talk, look at verse 15. God said to Moses, say this to the people of Israel. The Lord, that's his name, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob has sent me to you. Yahweh. Sometimes it's pronounced, mispronounced really, because this is not the original Hebrew pronunciation. But, but William Tyndale invented it, so it's come down to us, Jehovah. It probably was something more like Yahweh. But whatever it is, it's from the word, it's from the to be verb. Here's English grammar 101. I hope I won't turn you off. Some of you need to go back to school. English Grammar 101, there's the present tense, I am. There's the future tense, I will. There's first person, I. There's second person, say it, you. You know your English grammar. Come on, come on, come on. Third person, he, she, or it. Yeah. I eat, you eat, he eats. Got it? English grammar. When God speaks of himself, he says, I am. When we speak of him, come on, here's the test. He is. That's the meaning of capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. It's the word Yahweh, and it means he is. Now, most of us think, so. is that a complete sentence? I am. You are. He is. Well, it is a complete sentence, but we're looking for what? A predicate nominative. Oh, boy, you didn't know I was going to give you an English lesson. Don't worry, I won't fall off. I do this all the time. You should see me in Israel, standing on the edge of a cliff. My wife with her eyes getting bigger and bigger. But anyway... Uh, what was I saying? English grammar 101. Predic Thank you. Predicate nominative. We want to say this. You got to put a completion on that. Right? I am what? I am will. I am a preacher. I am a father. He is a rabbi. He is a president. You want a completer. <laughs> you know... You want a completer for I am? You fill in the blank. I'm whatever you need. <laughs> this is not some highly philosophical, ethereal, eternal being issue. It's what he is to his people. And we see Jesus picking this up in the Gospel of John. I am uh, the way. I am the truth. I am the life. I am. He, you fill in the blank. That's who he is. And that's what our great God is. And Moses, tell them, I'm whatever they need. I'm your deliverer. I'm your savior. I'm your God. I'm the great I am. And I believe Jesus picks this up also when saying to the people of his day, John 8, before Abraham was what? Now, what's good grammar? Right, right, right. You should expect him to say, before Abraham was, I was. Before she was, I was. I'm pointing to a gal who younger than me. Before she was, I see you there. I am? No, I wouldn't say that. I would say before she was, I was. But see, Jesus is doing something more than just saying I was before Abraham. He is identifying with the great Yahweh of the Old Testament. Before Abraham was, I am. <laughs> Thank you. 
There's one Baptist in here. <laughs> I said to the first hour, when I said a great statement about God, I said, you know, you guys are not a charismatic congregation. You are permitted, however, to say amen. amen. So three of them said amen. What a statement. Before Abraham was, I am. Moses, that's what you need to know about me. What's your name? I am. That's Yahweh. He is. All right, you ready to go? Oh, i got a couple more things. What if I go and they won't believe me? I go and say, all right. Children of Israel, I'm your deliverer under God. Follow me. And they go, <laughs> like that. What do I do next? <laughs> yeah, you know, what if I do what I'm called to do and, and it doesn't work out and, and, and people don't respond to, to my work? It's a big question that people have, particularly when they're launching out and doing what they believe God wants them to do. What if I'm not successful? Look at chapter 4, verse 1. Then Moses answered, but behold, they will not believe me or listen to my voice, for they will say, the Lord did not appear to you. They're going to have to take this by faith. I'm going to say, I was standing at the burning bush and God spoke to me and he told me to come and tell you to go and they say, we don't believe you. What do I do next? <laughs> oh God, I don't know if I want to buy into this job. What if I'm not successful? If God's called you, he'll take care of that. He'll take care of that, dear one. He'll take care of that. All right, God says, oh, God is so patient. This is an easy one, Mo. This is an easy one. They will not believe me. What's that in your hands? The staff. What do you think it is? I'm a shepherd. I've been holding this thing for 40 years. Throw it down. <laughs> it's a snake. Pick it up. <laughs> it's a staff. Moses, you got any more questions? Um... Put your hand in your, okay. Ooh, white like leprosy. Put it back in. Ooh. Hey, man, David Copperfield would like that. That's cool. You got any questions, Moses? Do you see, when I tell you to do something, I am going to give you the power and the ability to accomplish it. And if they need miracles, I'll show them miracles. And think of the ten signs in, 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 uh, in Egypt when Moses goes. The Nile turns to red. And, and th there's these attacks on these Egyptian gods. The cow god that they worship, Horus. Now the cows are dying of disease. The Nile which they worship, now the Nile turns to blood. Moses... If you need validation, I have miracles, and I'll do those. And those miracles for us came in the ministry of our Lord Jesus and the apostles, validating the power of the ministry so we can go forth knowing for sure that when God has called us, he will equip us, and he'll deal with the objections. Anything else, Moses? I got one more, Lord. Okay. Okay. God is so patient. One more. I'm not eloquent. Actually, look at verse 10. But Moses said to the Lord, Oh, my Lord, I am not eloquent. Actually, the Hebrew is ish devarim. I am not a man of words. Watch. Either in the past or since, you have spoken to your servant, but I am slow of speech and slow of tongue. Now, I'm going to give you my personal opinion here. I think the first three were really preparing for this. I think this is the real issue with Moses. He didn't get to practice his elocutionary art with the sheep for 40 years. 
What's he going to say back to? <laughs> Can't practice speech with that. And he may have been powerful in word and, and language in those first 40 years, but he'd forgotten it all. Not only that, I think he's, he's, he's talking about something very real and that's something I identified with here. He says, I'm heavy of tongue and heavy of speech, literally. His tongue was heavy. He couldn't speak well. He couldn't articulate the words. Thicken your tongue and tell us your name and your address. Thicken it. No, don't you do it. They will think we're charismatic, so everybody will be speaking in tongues. But anyway, listen to me. Thicken your tongue. My name is William Barnett. I let one night for tonight. But I've got a heavy tongue. I think he had a speech impediment. And the reason I, I say that is when I read the response. Who has made man's mouth, verse 11. In other words, his condition was a result of his creation, his birth. He had a speech impediment. Who has made man's mouth? We're still in English Grammar 101. This is a rhetorical question. The question answer is obvious. Who has made man's mouth? God. Who has made him mute or deaf? God. Who has made him seeing or blind? God. And then God says, in case you didn't catch it, is it not I, the Lord? I'm assuming responsibility for your speech impediment, Moses. And I'm still calling you. <laughs> I love that. Also, what are you telling me, guy? I know. I know your weaknesses. I know your failings. I know your inadequacies. You don't have to tell them to me. And in spite of that, I'm still calling you, Moses. And so what you need to know is not how eloquent you are, but when you go forth, God will be with your mouth. Verse 12, now therefore go and I will be with your mouth. He gets back to the I will be with you. I will be with your mouth. <laughs> Excuse me. I will be with your mouth. Sort of like becoming a um, speech impediment myself. And teach you what you shall speak. I'll be with you. Notice. I'll perform a miracle for you, Moses. And your speech impediment will go. No, I'll be with you. I'll be with you. If I've called you, you think I don't know your weaknesses? You think I don't know your inadequacies? I know who I'm calling, and I'll be with you. Perhaps God deliberately chose a leader who did not speak well to show that the message is so much more important than the medium. The message is so much more important than the medium. Pardon the personal illustration, but I can only tell you what I've experienced to be true. So pardon the personal illustration, but I've lived this. My Older sister and older aunt tell me it started this way. That as a preschooler, they would get me down, older sister, er, on the ground, older cousin on the ground, and tickle me unmercifully. And I would be screaming. <laughs> and they said, that's what caused you to start stuttering. I have no idea how scientific that is, my friends. Probably a speech pathologist say, that doesn't have anything to do with stutter. But that's what they said. All I do know is that early on in my elementary years, I began stuttering. 
And it continued on, and it continued on, and it continued on. Right through my teenage years. A little bit about stuttering. There's two types, well, there's more than two types, but there's two main types of stutterers. There's the stammerer who repeats the initial consonant. ba 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 ball. Then there's the person who has a, um, a stammer, uh, which means a halt, where they can't get the initial consonant out. So instead of ba 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 ball, it's ball. And you've all had experiences in conversing with the stutterer, and you're a little embarrassed for him or her, and uh, you, uh, you understand what I'm saying. But it's sort of like, you know, I don't mind saying this because I'm a stutterer, but uh, I was a stutterer, and, uh, and he says, you ask your name, and, 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 and I become bug-eyed at you. <laughs> Bill! And you're so embarrassed for me. And then uh, God called me to preach. I didn't say this in the first service. So intensely personal and painful. <clears throat> I was 18 years old, and I was about to uh, uh, go to Wofford University in Spartanburg, South Carolina, to pitch baseball and major in chemistry. Took chemistry my senior year and fell in love with it. I said, where has it been all my life? But I really love baseball. And I had a scholarship, and then uh, the Lord was working on me all summer. After my senior year, I graduated and got the scholarship, and I'm working. I'm, I'm, I'm mowing grass, cutting the lawn. Cutting grass, as they used to say in the South. Uh, alone a lot that summer, between ball games, and, and the Lord is talking to me. I don't mean visibly or audibly, but he's talking to me. You know what I'm saying. And he's calling me into the ministry. And I'm saying, I'm going to pitch baseball. I'm going to go to Wofford. And you're going to say, and God's saying, I want to call you into my service. And I'm fighting and fighting and fighting and fighting. And one of the reasons I was fighting is that I stuttered. And uh, the day before I was to go into Wofford, I go over to B -b 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 Bob Jones University, 28 miles from my home. And I said, I want to pre 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 prepare for the ministry. They looked at me and they said, okay, well, all right. Now, I didn't have my clothes with me because I just went over to Bob Jones without, well, I had clothes, but <laughs> sorry, the rest of my clothes and stuff. So I had to go back home to get my clothes 28 miles away. And my mother, bless her heart, my mother, a widow, for two years, with no money, I get $48 a month Social Security survivor benefit as a kid. I got it until I was 22. And my mother, bless her heart, was not a believer. And I say, Mama, I'm not going to Wofford. She said, why? She, I said, I'm going to Bob Jones. She said, why? I said, I'm going to... I want to be a minister. This is what my mother said to me. She said, you want to be a minister? How can you preach? You stutter. And I didn't have an answer. If I, if I don't tell you the last chapter with my mother, remind me for the end of the story. So I go over, what's the first course that a freshman at Bob Jones University takes? Freshman speech. Public speech. Oy, just what I need. And here's where I start to see the hand of the Lord. There was about 15 classes of freshman speech. And I'm registering and I don't know much to do. There's about eight different professors teaching it. And I pick William Martin. And I get into class the first day, and he's stuttering in class. A speech teacher stuttering? Yes. William Martin was a recovered, recovering stutterer. I'll tell you something about stuttering. If you modulate and speak highly, you'll never stutter. If you sing, you never stutter. 
if you converse at a normal level, you will stutter. But you can't go around talking to everybody like this. Hi, nice to meet you. <laughs> so in class, in conversation, he would stutter. When he's doing Shakespeare, he wouldn't stutter. When he's doing speeches, he wouldn't stutter. But he understood me. I could have had any speech teacher. Why did I get him? So at the end of freshman speech, I'm a powerful elocutionist. I still stutter. And between my freshman and sophomore years, I was undergoing real agony about this calling, starting to wonder. Do you know, and I can laugh about it and tease about it because I am a stutterer. If you had a preacher that stuttered and he gave a 45-minute message, you realize that message would be an hour and a half? <laughs> you wouldn't want to listen to that. And I knew that. And I said, oh, God. And that summer was a soul agony. At, and guess what? I'm reading Exodus. I'm reading Exodus. And I get to this, and I, he, and Moses says, I'm slow of speech, I'm not eloquent. And I said, that's me. Then the Lord said, who's made Madden's mouth? Who made him mute, deaf, seeing or blind? It's not I, the Lord. You go, and I'll be with your mouth and teach you what you will speak. Okay, you win. You win. Now, for Moses, it, it wasn't even that wasn't enough, because Moses said, send somebody else. <laughs> And Moses sends, uh, and God sends Aaron, and Aaron starts to be the speaker. But as you see in the in, uh, book of Exodus, Moses starts to take over for Aaron, and he eventually becomes it. So God takes care of it. So, uh, yeah. Good ending that story. In two years, my mom met an elder in the church who was a widower. And he led her to the Lord. And she became my biggest fan over the years. But hated to come to hear me preach because she was still afraid that I might stutter. <laughs> That's a mom. Hey, listen, I've lived this. And I'm not saying I've reached it, but uh, I've lived it. And, and I know that if God calls you, um, he'll equip you. He'll equip you. He'll take care of your inadequacies. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I'm not saying he'll cure you of every malady that you have. And there's enough left in my speech, and if you stay around me enough, you'll know that it's still there, to remind me that who's, who's boss? I just stuttered right there. Who's, who's boss? Um, and uh, to remind me that um, I didn't solve this problem. He did. So... Um, what does it mean for us? You may not be Moses, but you may suffer from the same fears and inadequacies Moses had. Who are you? I'll be with you. Who am I? I am the great I am. They won't believe me. I'll take care of that. I stutter. Ah, you tell me something I don't know? I know your inadequacies. I'm your adequacy. Trust me and go forth and knock them dead. And maybe I can encourage somebody to do that. Hey, it may take a while. It may take a while. I remember standing in the practice shacks at Bob Jones University practicing my sermons. <laughs> a congregation of zero because the door was closed. There was the piano, but I was here just preaching to myself. People were walked by, looking at me. Anyway. Hey, listen. I, I heard a saying years ago. It's sort of stupid, silly saying, but it meant a lot to me. Give God your heart, and he will comb, comb the kinks out of your hair. Don't you laugh at that, sir. Hair, hair, hair. Anyway. Give God your heart. You got, I, I got kinky hair. Give God your heart. He'll take care of that. He'll straighten out your hair, okay? And if I can encourage somebody to not give up,
my time has not been spent in vain. I have an iPad here. <laughs> it says right now, I wish I could help, but you don't seem to be connected to the internet. <laughs> Thank you, Siri. <laughs> what a come down. Maybe I needed that. Maybe I needed that. So let me encourage you to, to um, you may not all be Moses, but God has each of us a calling and a service to do. You may be scared to death as you're about to do it. Trust him. He knows what he's doing. If he's called you to do it, he, all, he also will help you to do it. He'll comb those kinks out of your hair, okay? Father, thank you for this word, and thank you for Moses, and thank you for um, how you worked in his life and work in our lives, Lord. With all of our inadequacies, show yourself strong in our behalf for your glory, not for ours. And I can honestly say, any ability I have is from you. Thank you for being faithful to me all these years. Show yourself strong for these dear people, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.